about timings, so I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes just so you know what I do. I don't just sit there and play the Lego. Uh, then I'll, we'll have the workshop, 60 minutes, maybe 80 if we get delayed or whatever to try and do the thing. Then we'll have a break. And then we'll just have the half hour discussion about consent in R and what we all think of it. Okay? So, a little bit about me and how I got to this point where I'm creating and running consent workshops with Lego Bricks. So all my art comes from my life experiences, which I can't go into all of it right now, but you know, briefly, I was a stay-at-home parent for 12 years, and you know, I'm not going to say that I you know, walk in the shoes of women and what they have to do and the fear of sexual assault and stuff, but I did swap gender roles, if you like, took the other role that is kind of traditionally thought of. I was a person picking up my daughter from school, taking her to swimming lessons, hanging out with the other mums, if you like, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, getting the food, dinner ready, washing, whatever, right? So, you know, I've seen a bit of the other side, shall we say. But anyway, when she got a little bit older, I thought, well, I can't got time to do something now, but I, like, also women in that position, I'd had a career break, quite a long career break. And, you know, it's quite difficult to go back into the workplace once you've had this career break. I was, like, a web designer, Things have moved on, and you know, just don't have the same energy for that. So I just thought, well, okay, I'll start this small art project, and I'll make some kind of physical art object. I chose Lego as my medium, and I soon progressed to uh, three-dimensional wall-hanging artwork. So three-dimensional, it comes out from the from the canvas. Uh, I live with two very strong women, my wife and daughter. So I started creating portraits of iconic and strong women. You know, I was of the idea there was enough portraits of men already, so let's just let's just cut straight to it. So I'll just show you a, a few of these. As you know, this is RPG. That's Malala, Peace, Nobel Peace Prize winner, an activist. And I've done quite a few of these, I'll just show you a few. And there's Greta Thunberg, the climate change activist. So this was kind of my early uh, forays into like women's issues and stuff. So early on I had a small show in the foyer of a local bank. Right, and I decided if I was going to highlight women and talk about feminism and things like that, you know, I should walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And that, so to do that, I got in touch with my local domestic violence and sexual assault agency, and I said, I'll create an artwork for you and we'll auction it off and we'll raise money for you. Because I think uh, when you talk the talk, there's one thing when you walk the walk, you actually give money to the organisation. So that's actually delivery. And we sold the artwork and we raised the money for that. And of course they were, they were delighted with that. And after that, we kept in touch and they were very encouraging about my mission and all the things I was doing. And the next thing I started doing was what I called the Freedom Without Judgment series. A series of things like jean shorts and skirts and items of clothing that women might wear. Uh, you know, that kind of objectifies them. And I presented, but I presented that comment to see what people, how people react. This was primarily in protest at the gender-specific dress code at my daughter's middle school. <laughs> so I'll just show you a few of these. So there's a pair of jean shorts, um, a pair of jeans, and a skirt. So th this is a, uh, the Colours and series I, I absolutely love. It's, all the blues and stuff is really cool. So uh, the agency then said, oh, well, you know, they were kind of, this is interesting. Why don't you get involved with us more directly? So bear in mind by now, this is a few years on, I'd worked my way up from small shows and then group shows and then like, a piece in the art gallery here, to approaching a New York gallery called Krauss Gallery, and they gave me a chance, and I sold some work, and I ended up being represented by them, you know, and they say, like, you know, the rest is history, it's like, it, it, that's how that happened. And so, I, for the agency, I attended, attended Rider University uh, in the evenings twice a week for four months, and took the 80 hours of domestic violence and sexual assault training that they offer. And I uh, graduated from that. And this, this training, uh, you know, it varies. You might get a district attorney coming in and saying, well, this is the law, these are the definitions of certain things, and this is how hard it is to prosecute, and we kind of do this, and this is our, our goals. Or you might get things about restraining orders and how they're delivered and how they work and what's the purpose of them. And the fact, you know, like a restraining order is just a piece of paper, it doesn't save anybody. And they do all the statistics, like three murders a day of women from domestic violence, you know, the biggest cause of injury to women in America. You know, there's all kinds of terrible statistics. And 
You know, then they talk about examples of domestic violence and sexual assault, really graphic, true life stories, 911 calls, right? And I tell you, there's a lot of tears in that class. A very, very traumatic and very special thing that was like kind of life changing to me because I'd gone from like, I'm gonna say privileged feminism to, well, you know, pay gap and, you know, all this kind of stuff and like women don't get opportunities and, and then you see the real kind of the real result of discrimination against women and it's kind of it's life-changing right and from graduating from that course I did become a, a member of the agency's response team which meant actually talking with victims of domestic violence on the night of them reporting the incident and uh, you know just offering them support and what the agency can do so clearly that kind of enormous impact is going to inform and influence my work and that's when I started the Enthusiastic Consent series uh, and I'm going to show you just a few of those there's one and there's another and this was just kind of showing kind of intimacy with perhaps gender fluid perhaps non-dominant kind of figures just just to try and even up the balance and like, start a discussion with people because it's kind of blurred people kind of see what they want to see but that was the uh, opening line so I then had this kind of idea we could take the message directly to the public by getting them to involved in making them like we're going to do tonight. And I collaborated with Princeton University and their office that educates the student body on sexual assault, domestic violence and offers some support. Uh, we created what I, was like a five hour consent workshop where a piece was created by 100 students working in pairs and they practiced consent while they worked together. And I've just got a three and a half minute video that I'm going to show you now of that event and just after that we'll get into our our thing so i don't know if the sound is going to come through or how this is going to work but let's see what happens okay. over the last few months i've been collaborating with the share office at princeton university on an artwork based on the theme of consent and the students today are going to build the consent piece live out of Lego bricks. So he's been working with Legos and with gender for quite some time, really doing different plays on gender and wanted to expand into enthusiastic consent and then knew I was with Princeton and thought it would be great to take art out of the studio and bring it into the community in a more public way. In a way I want a lot of people to come in and everybody to join in and build part of the piece and feel the kind of the buzz of being part of the, uh, of the whole process. Interesting. I've never really thought about taking consent kind of outside of the context of interpersonal relationships. Um, and I think for me the thing that jumped out the most was just the importance of communication and how like even though we had to communicate about every single piece, like it didn't feel awkward or difficult. It was just kind of a flow of communication that we established. I think I was really conscious about how we were tracking even when things were going well, like things that not just being about sort of an initial thing, but yeah. even as things are progressing in the way that you expect them to, mm -hmm. making sure that you're constantly. I think it's cool to see that it's really procedural, so there is not this one moment where one person says yes and then everything's fine, but like you have to continue asking, correcting each other. It's, it's a process, it's ongoing, mm -hmm. yeah. We really like the idea of getting to create not only an enthusiastic consent art piece, but also apply consent to the effort. People are really enjoying it. It's, um, it's just a great way to really build on a skill that we think is much more expansive than just simply what two people are doing and thinking about it related to sexual intimacy. So for us, I think it's really come together very well. I really like the idea that like to kind of have that full picture of these two people together, you had to have so much communication and so much working together, um, and then it creates that picture of kind of harmony and how can I think about consent and think about communication in just ordinary situations with people, whether I know them or not. Sweet. So I guess you guys want to see what's going to finish. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. It's a 
with ambivalent. Like it could be two women, it could be two men. Mm -hmm. I think it's sort of gender ambiguous. Like I think I saw it and saw two women. So I think that's kind of cool. What do you think? Well, I thought it was pretty good. It's hard work, a lot of hard work. I know. We've got a real buzz going in the middle of the day, which we is did. very exciting. It was very exciting. Uh, All these drop bys. Yeah. People were interested and came by and got involved. Yeah, I mean, everybody had a lot of fun. I thought it was really, really exciting. And they just applied consent outside of the bedroom. Like, what's better than that? <laughs> So that's the piece over there that they made at Princeton. <laughs> so uh, we're about to get into our thing now. So, so I'm just going to put this up. So this is, I'm not going to make you sign the pledge, <laughs> but we have this pledge <laughs> that they will sign before they could participate. I will ask before I act, I will look for a verbal and enthusiastic response. I will make sure there is always a choice. I will check in regularly, particularly when I am unsure. I will show respect for all the responses. I will stop immediately if consent is withdrawn or becomes unclear. So I just want to say this residency was about producing a smaller, more deliverable, shorter uh, workshop, because five hours is a huge effort. And so that's what we've done here. Uh, we've taken out the bit where you um, pick the pieces out yourself, because with COVID and stuff, we can't have everybody putting their hands in. And what you're going to do is, you're going to build a piece with the instructions here. Uh, there will be mistakes in the bags because the disorder is all messed up. But I have lots of spares over there, so if you get to think, oh, you know, there's a such and such missing, I will help you out. So, if you want to get into pairs, and I'll come around and start you off. And, um, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. You ready?
We don't have to actually, sorry. So, that's what we can. so first thing, um, we're going to do like 30 minutes or whatever we're all going to do. First thing is, how many people have actually brought a consent by the way that we should to discuss? I know you did, and you did. So I've got these two. Anybody else? You did? Two or three? Okay. So I'm going to do a couple first, and then we'll go through your three, and then we'll see if we do any more. Okay? I'm just going to start my timer so we don't do like two hours of this. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm going to bring up one first. Not that one, not that one. There we go, there we go. This is the one I want to start with. Does anyone want to say anything about the thing? That, is, that came to my mind as, as an example. Let me talk about it. Okay, this is background. This was taken, uh, this is called, this is by Alfred Eisenstadt, DJ Day in Times Square. Okay, and it, it's a Navy sailor kissing a total stranger, right? And it's one of the most famous photos like of all time. And it was like, a week after that they put it on the cover of Life magazine, right? So I'll, I'll just count. To me, this is a sickening photo. The uh, woman is completely passive, right? Almost lifeless. It's very common for sexual assault victims to act completely lifeless as a coping me mechanism. And I think, worse than that, I think it was emblematic of the time that they're saying the message is, Right? Women, your time in the country while well, we're away is over. The men are coming back, and we're going to come and take what is ours. And I think all that is encapsulated in this image. I really find that both the way it's cropped and the expressions of the people watching also really kind of complicated in a way that I had never. I've seen this photo of course yeah. before, but just someone laughing, someone curious, someone nervous. It's just an interesting to kind of see the bystanders. Yeah. So a little bit of extra on this, they then a few years ago decided to make a statue of it. Right? Uh -huh. I think that's in San Diego. And you know what the name of that statue is? Unconditional surrender. Yikes. So this is today, right? Wow. That's pretty that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And one last photo. So we had a good idea. Mm. This was a, uh, well, it was vandalized, so to speak. Uh, so somebody put, put that on it. Actually, the day after the man who photographed it died, actually, that was put on there. And the Me Too that was put on there was then covered up overnight, mm. and nobody said any more about it. So we just move on. There we go. Has there been any context around the photo? Just out of curiosity? I mean, uh, is that the yeah. study we're commenting? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of curious. Well, I did a bit of research into that because, so the woman was a dental assistant and she really didn't know the guy, right? And it was just a kind of a random kind of thing. Uh, what I found was that there has been some discussion that this is a, shows women subordinated to men and it's emblematic of rape culture, but there's been no mainstream discussion of that, okay, like in blogs and kind of people who are, you know, up to speed on these kind of things have said it, but it, there's been no, like, mainstream... Understand that they don't know each other, or they're not involved with each other, or have some kind of well, there is, relationship. Well, completely passive. Well, yeah, but it's, it's a photograph, which is just a clip I know, of a I know, moment of time. time. So there is, obviously, we have much more context for it, you know, today, and understanding the story, and of course, like, you know, um, having that understanding alters how we would perceive it or look at it, but just as an image on its own, you know, so you're, you're looking purely at the body language of the woman. Yeah, but this was, this body language, which I think is problematic, mm -hmm. was then used mm -hmm. a week later on the cover of Life magazine, right? So we think it would be more sensitive to the body language of the woman in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Two things. I mean, one is sort of the narrative, and then the other is 
what it is asked to represent is what's interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, because we kind of yeah, it's like when the, you're being presented the pieces with the, the um, jean shorts. So you know, or or just the common expression of you know, I, it's pornography when you see it. You just know that it is. You know, but that's not an actual. You're not actually saying anything by saying it like that. So just the an image on its own can't, you know, inherently have um, like that. It doesn't explicitly tell me that from just just the image on its own. But the over surrounding story and the context of it is what makes you feel or well, understand. The, how how would this be different from the Marilyn one with the skirt up? Well. I, I mean, I know how it's going to be different, but I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I, I, I don't know. What do you want to say about that? Because well, this is the point. This was yeah. done at the, when men were returning to the country mm -hmm. after they had been away. And I think it, it clearly showed that men are coming to reclaim women. You know. I think Marilyn Monroe probably owned that picture on some level herself. Of course, she. Right? So she, that's different, right? Yes, but but it, it is a it is connected to this in that she is a sex object that all men apparently desire. And um, sorry, I have to take this. Right, let me show you another thing. All right, go. Photography is tricky. Okay. This is uh, another interesting one. So this is a. Uh, yeah, this is by it's a guy called Jayan Bonhoeffer. 1579 to 1583, this was made, which is four years. And he didn't actually have any purpose when he made this. But afterwards, um, some uh, monk, so we say, a Thai monk, an art collector, suggested the title this could be, this should be called. The Rape of the Sabine Woman. So, I mean, the title there says it all. And what it represents is the, the story that the men came and they uh, plundered the Sabine women, the Romans, and took them away to take pure virginity. So, comment? I didn't realize he didn't have a working title when he produced that. Yeah. That's interesting. So, I guess that makes me question what his intent was originally. The point is, you can go into, I think it's in Florence or somewhere like that, you can go in there and you can view it, and there's this piece that's called The Rape of the Southern Woman, and you think, okay. So, it's not really bad, is it? I don't think. Okay, so we'll do one of yours now. So do I don't know what this is, really. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us what it is? It's a, a Louise Bourgeois uh, sculpture. Um, she's the one who's mostly famous for those giant spider sculptures. And uh, it's called Together. What's it called again? Together. Together. Well, the things are equal. Mm -hmm. I'll say that, won't it? So it's good to get an example where that worked. Okay. For well, more than anyway, and a woman. I suppose she was that. My understanding is that she became very fascinated by notions of um, giving and receiving between bodies. Mm -hmm. And to me, this uh, is a sculpture that feels very, very big out there. Yeah. And also pretty, like, agendered. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. OK, we'll get AJ's next, shall we? I'm not next. Easy. <laughs> Wow. 
want to tell us about this? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, without consent, I mean, you just, <laughs> one mammal dominates another mammal, and this mammal already has a coat. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think, the, one the, the thing with the magazine is, it's tricky for me, and it's not a critique, because this is not a critique, but the magazine thing is tricky because you need so much context. Like, because the way the photograph works, at almost any time I can capture a picture where it seemed like something's happening. Now, with context, then we know what's happening. But then I also, with that context, I also don't have interviews from the <coughs> woman who was kissed as well. And that could also be problematic, or it could make everything a little less problematic. Who knows? But this is in the studio. So this is set up. And just, you know, I'm pretty sure it's about this end. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the cat didn't agree. It's not the cat mm -hmm. Okay, Mike, what have you got for it? Is it music? Um, no, uh, it's, it's a trope from literature and film that, I, that always irks me, which is when, um, as an example, Indiana Jones or, um, you know, the, the gruff male lead who repulses the female lead. But there's a moment where he forces a kiss on her as she falls, you know, in love with him from that moment. And that was always something that I found to be very problematic. It's James Bond in a nutshell. It's, uh, yeah, it's every, I mean, pick them, pick you know? It's, it's um, ubiquitous in the genre. I think there are more women screenwriters that might not happen as much. I agree. But it's just <laughs> such a strange, it's, it's a strange notion because, it, you know, if you live in the real world and you try something like that, you know, you get smacked or kicked or, I mean, I would, I would assume. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I've ever attempted. <laughs> but in that, in that vein, have you seen the second Wonder Woman? No. I mean, don't. 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 <laughs> have you seen the second Wonder Woman? Yeah, I mean, so Wonder Woman and her dead boyfriend, they get down in another man's body. Like, that he did not come up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, really. Yeah, this guy is just a vessel being used yeah. so they can get busy, and it's a... Uh, it's disturbing. It is! It's not, it's not beautiful, in a way, that he, he is, his lifeless body is allowed to travel. Be because it's not like ghosts. Like, Whoopi... <laughs> no, 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 because Whoopi yeah. allowed uh -huh. Sexy Swayze to get up in there so her and Demi can get down. It would have been cool to watch Whoopi and Demi get down at the time with so much consent and a ghost. But in the Wonder Woman, this man didn't have a choice. So him and his... All his parts were just being used, mm -hmm. and it's like they didn't, they didn't they didn't talk about it. It was like, oh, well, you know, this. Oh, this, that's so sweet. So is, is consent is explicit to verbal a verbal response? No, body language, and you know, I mean, but it's very easy to misread mm -hmm. body language or to. Put your own completely lifeless. So that's not. He's sure well, I don't agree with that. that. But oftentimes, with these, you know, you have these situations where it's one, two individuals who don't. Um, reside in the same place in terms of what what happened, how it happened, who gave consent, how that consent yeah. was given. So I'm sort of, oh, she had a few beers, we were just at a party, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, you know, uh, she didn't say no, these kinds of things that you hear, you know. I mean, and that's where language, I mean, I can't help thinking about, like, there's this whole writing about Columbus, you know, and, and coming in, and, and, and in Columbus's diaries, he uses language, you know, marvelous, marvelous, and to them I gave a new name, and I was not contradicted. And like the yeah. word contradict didn't exist, you know? I mean, it was this linguistic occupation. So it's just really interesting to, you know, to kind of think like, I mean, what are you looking at first, and then what are you seeing? You know, and it kind of depends on the body you're living in, or the species you are. Or the, I mean, I don't have an answer, I just think yeah. it's more questions. But the cat could have yeah. scratched up the owner, and uh, <laughs> or it could have been totally cool with it, you know? But there's not, we don't have a way to yeah. communicate with no. the feline, you know, species. No, I mean, we're, we're the dominant mammal, so. Yeah, so it's been aware wherever you tell it's aware. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it well, finds back. As our, I was art director of a photo studio, and part of our job was people bringing in these, the pets mm -hmm. and stuff, and you have to shoot them where they shit. And you see dogs trying to take shit off this? and try not to uh, try. <laughs> dogs trying to take things off and stuff like that. But it's easy to find consent when I'm the dominant one. So it's like, oh, my dog loves this. Right, right, right. And you know, and no, it's you like, love it. Yeah, you love it. So it's easy. Like, I mean, you look at 
Cezanne, like, uh, his paintings and his uh, escapades with all these brown women, and the way he would write about it, make art about it, was almost as if everything was cool. Go again. Like, oh, go again, thank you. Like, everything was cool, you know what I mean? All these 12 year olds, everything's all right. And it's like, well, it's easier for everything to be all right when you are, you know, you're the dominant one, you make the pictures, you tell the story, you lead the history, you're the message maker. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm not meant to the noise about, you know, she had a few beers, I don't know. Men are not here to take things just from people without knowing that it's permiss permissible, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of a, a change in their mentality that's required, you know. Oh, she had a few beers, maybe she was into it. That's not an excuse, right? That's like, yeah. it's, not, it's not like about how much did she drink or whatever. Irrelevant, right? It's all irrelevant. So we do another one. Yeah. Uh, so, so through your uh, yeah, you text. Check that out, check that out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to jail. Not that one. Do you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, my legs are doing so. Right. This is uh, To Lose the Trek. Uh, <coughs> uh, ironically, I had to go and find a picture of two women kissing to find consent. Why? Well, so he did a lot of things of intimacy, same-sex people. Um, yeah, I think that's quite good, don't you? Pretty unusual, though. <coughs> it's not easy to find anything like non-contemporary. I mean, to lose the track was completely out there guy, right? So that's, so yeah, that, that is a beautiful thing. I'm just I'm saying, you know, when you, when you look at things, there's so much we see that isn't consent and we accept it. And then I find something, and it's actually quite unusual, right? So I'll just, uh, I'll just. What's the name of that painting? It's called In Bed, The Kiss. Nice. Nice title, yeah. So the, 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 the yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in answer to your point, Michael, about you know, she had a few beers and stuff, there we go. Right, so I think this is an amazing, amazing piece of work. I think this kind of, in one image, kind of implies the consequences of non-consent, violence against women from the perspective of the woman. And it's the Cindy Sherman uh, photograph. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. And um, she produced this for Art Forum magazine. And interestingly, <laughs> They decided that this image was too provocative for its sexuality and declined to publish it. Amazing. <laughs> right? I didn't know that in history. That's wild. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Because yeah. I mean, so, at the time, the public publishing was a pretty well shit. Yeah. Yeah. Good for That's not I mean, What's wrong with being provocative? I mean, she's Powerful. got fear, she's got claustrophobia, she's got anxiety, she's in bed. I mean, this is an incredibly powerful image. Mm -hmm. And then they de declined to publish it on the basis of its sexuality. That's mm -hmm. really well. Yeah. yeah, 1981. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I've got like two more. Which I can't ask another question while you're here? Looking to it. But I'm just curious about your, your training. But, um, just addressing um, the issue of consent, is it always corresponding to power dynamics? Does there always have to be one person who has more authority or power than that person? Okay. So there yeah. can be an, an equal relationship still, issues of consent. I think an equal relationship is probably a good place to start, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree, but unfortunately that's not how most places are in the world, you know? There's no reason why they shouldn't be, right? Sure. We've given women all the sexuality in the world, right? And then it's not there just for men to take it away again, right? So there's a lot of discussion we could have over that. Yeah, I think we'll go for equality. So I've got another one for you here. I, I couldn't find very many with consent, so I'm glad that AJ came up with that cool one. This is amazing. Um, this is a, uh, a portrait of, um, I think it might be missing a bit off the corner there. I think you can see his whole face. Maybe not, I don't know. Oops. Let's just try and 
Hello. So anyway, this is a portrait of Jean Louis David, the famous hairdresser. Um, this, I mean, this image. What does anybody want to say about this image before I say anything? Great haircut. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> so great. I mean. The power in this that he's demonstrating, he's literally taking part of her body away. He's literally taking a physical part of her body, I mean, she's naked, right? And this is supposedly a portrait of a famous person, right? And it's just 1974. I mean, it's interesting that the arm, the gestures, I was thinking about your stick figures, could be in like this sense of like the, the the intensity, I mean, the uh -huh. shaking is, that's what stands out to me, less the naked even the haircut, yeah. but there's so, but the sort of... The aggression there. The aggression yeah. in the arm is sort yeah. of, um, comp it's, yeah, I don't, I, that's what sort of stands out to me. It, I think it would also be a very different photograph if he was positioned behind her. I'm not saying it would be more yeah. consensual feeling by any means, but yeah. him holding this piece of her in front of her face mm -hmm. is yeah. quite wild. Mm -hmm. It's like, I own you. <laughs> and she can't even look at it. She's like looking off. Yeah. And also hair, you know, symbolically is like a very important, you know, cutting hair is about, yeah. you know, changing your, or when you have a big change in your life or, you know, so that's very symbolic. And it also reminds me of all these stories you hear about, you know, these, um, like predominantly black kids with natural hair who are trying to go to their wrestling match or they have dreads or they have whatever kind of hairstyle they have and they're forcibly cut without their or the uh, nuns who give up their hair once they put on the cowl, and they're, mm -hmm. and they're that, that is also a, a taking away of your femininity. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, Muslims covering the hair um, when, once they uh, have or married. Or Jewish women also. Exactly. When they're married, they always wear a wig or yes. a hat. Yeah, so it's uh, taking away her, 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 her feminine. Why is he in the picture? Do you know why? Was, was, was this like he's a famous hairdresser. This is, I mean, but this is the final portrait. Like this was the final one that they selected. Yeah, I think I've got the bell the corner. From like the two hundred and twelve. Yeah, but was this like, like in Vanity day. Fair or was this like in? It was Helen Newton. I, okay. I didn't really yeah. research it huh. that much, but Helen Newton did, did lots of portraits. I mean, we all know about Helen Newton and all his stuff. But I mean, this, this is like remarkable for the the the, the illustration of the, how he's taking something physical from her, which is almost symbolic of an assault, right? And then oh, that's been the way to, that's been what has been chosen to sort of symbolize his art form, which, I mean, you know, that's what's kind of odd. It's yeah, it seems like there's so many different ways to. Yeah. yeah. You mean that you're saying it's about him and his power? Yeah. Not it's so like, much about her and the haircut, it's about him and he's this great yeah. hairdresser. Yeah, but, and that, I mean, yeah, but, it, but he's naked and it's not like he's transformed her into something that she loses his job, right? Well, she, she's a sculptor and he, and, and he has cut away the bad parts of her <laughs> and, you know, left her in perfection according to him. Yeah, I don't think anything it says. So I'm just going to finish with one of my pieces and just so you get an idea of what I'm trying to achieve, right? So this is one of my pieces where I'm trying to show two figures with like indeterminate sexuality possibly and they're kind of in a fairly equal, intimate situation and that, that's really all I'm trying to do, right? I'm just trying to show consent by that way, by equality and intimacy. And, yeah.